nanocrystalline steel, a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very strong, tough. I want to explain to you what I mean by these terms, very strong, tough, and cheap. So, first of all, bulk. What do we mean by bulk? If you go to a university, then bulk means, you know, a small sample which you can feel in your hand. Yeah? What I mean by bulk is something very big. Yeah? So, if you look over here, there's a, there's a human being. So, this is big. And I'd like to make a steel which can be very strong in this size. What do I mean by nanocrystalline? Well, if you ask uh, students in a university, they've heard a lot about carbon nanotubes. Uh, these are carbon nanotubes, and we've got to get crystals inside our steel which are smaller than carbon nanotubes. Okay? And what do I mean by cheap? Well, you know, the price must be less than a bottle of water of the same weight. Okay, it's no use if it is going to be an extremely expensive thing which you've made by equi-channel angular processing or something like that. So, the problem is to design such a steel. And many, many years ago, we already had steel which was 10 gigapascals in strength. You can see over there that if I make a, a single crystal of iron which, uh, which is about, uh, you know, 2 micrometers in size, it will have a strength of 10 gigapascals. Okay? And the reason why it is so strong is because when you make a crystal very small, the chances of finding a defect, a dislocation inside that are very small. So if you don't have a dislocation, then you are basically pulling it until the atoms fall apart. Right? So you are reaching the ideal strength of iron. But as soon as you start to make the crystal bigger, the strength collapses because you will have defects. Okay, so you can see that this is not a good way of producing strong materials to rely on perfection. Because as you make them larger, you will have defects. And those defects are equilibrium defects. That means they won't disappear even if you anneal for a very, very long time. And that's the reason why, you know, uh, many of you will have seen uh, lots of papers where carbon nanotubes are discussed. So this is what a carbon nanotube is. It's a, a sheet of carbon atoms which is folded around and then it forms a tube. And the reason why this has been causing uh, a lot of uh, attention is because when you measure the strength, it is very, very high. You know, it's about 130 gigapascals along the tube unimaginably high strength, okay? And the modulus along the tube is about 1.2 terapascals, which is, you know, something like six times that of steel. So many people have been saying that, look, this will replace steel in the future, okay? And what they are doing is they are completely ignoring work which was done long time ago, which shows that as you scale the size of a specimen, you will definitely get defects. There are equilibrium defects because say I work out the free energy of formation of a defect, so this is for the creation of one defect. That energy opposes the formation of a defect. But at the same time, when I introduce a defect, I increase the number of ways in which I can arrange the atoms. So that's an entropy term. And this term favors the formation of a defect. I, I differentiate this equation, I can calculate the equilibrium number of defects. And what I demonstrated uh, a couple of years ago is that when we make a carbon nanotube greater than 2 millimeters, the strength will collapse to much less than steel. Okay? So it is really foolish to talk about carbon nanotubes achieving the properties of steel. Fundamental science tells you it's impossible to do. Okay. Any method which assumes that the material will be perfect will not work as soon as you scale up the properties of, uh, scale up the size of that material. Now, there is another way of uh, getting strength, and that is by putting lots of defects in, increasing the dislocation density, the amount of grain surface per unit volume, and so forth. So you can take a piece of steel 
uh, say 50 grams of it and stretch it out into two kilometers and that gives you this wire which is made by Kobe steel it's called cipher scientific iron and you can see that the strength is five and a half gigapascals and it's so ductile that you can tie a knot with it you can't do that with a carbon fiber for example it's a zero ductility okay but the problem or, uh, of course this leads to a much lower sensitivity to size so this is the data that I showed you in the previous graph uh, for perfect crystals and this is for uh, the wire which is produced by severe deformation so it's no longer sensitive to size because we are relying on defects to produce the strength but when you produce strength by severe deformation you will be limited in the size of the sample that you can produce. It'll be like a wire or a very thin sheet. Uh, and just to show you what the size of that wire that Kobe steel produces, uh, we define the size of a thread in terms of a unit known as a denier. All right? So if you go to buy you know, women's stockings or socks, then you buy them in terms of denier, which is the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. So women's stockings are about 10 denier in size and men's socks are about 50 denier and cipher is finer than any of those it's 9 denier so you can't actually use cipher to construct a bridge or something like that okay? whenever we produce strength by deformation we will be limited in the form of the material that we can produce so just to summarize the strength that is produced by deformation we can only produce limited forms okay? And strength in small particles, which relies on perfection, will not work as soon as you make the particles large. So whether that's carbon nanotubes or single crystals of iron, as soon as you make them large, the strength collapses. Because of entropy, which means there will be an equilibrium concentration of defects. Now, of course, in the steel industry, uh, really massive advances in technology happened back in the 1960s and early 70s when thermomechanical processing and microalloying became possible. So this completely changed the quality of life for most human beings because the properties of steels improved remarkably. Yeah? And the main thing was that by adding microalloying additions like niobium and uh, titanium, the grain size could be reduced dramatically uh, for ferrite. Okay, because you process the austenite, fine grains of austenite, and fine grains of ferrite. So let's ask the question, what is the smallest austenite grain size that I could achieve by thermomechanical processing? Well, as soon as you start to reduce the grain size by thermomechanical processing, you are introducing defects inside your material in the form of grain boundaries. And the grain boundary has an energy, sigma, which is the energy per unit area. If I take that energy per unit area and I multiply it by the amount of grain boundary I have in the volume of material, so S stands for the surface per unit volume, then I get the total amount of energy that is locked inside the material as grain boundaries. Okay? So delta G here is the total amount of energy that is locked inside our material in the form of grain boundaries. And that energy has to be provided by thermomechanical processing. So when I form ferrite, that energy will be provided by the free energy change in going from austenite to ferrite. So I can relate the stored energy in the form of grain boundaries to the driving force for transformation. And I get a simple equation which tells me the size of the ferrite grains that I can achieve by thermomechanical processing as a function of the driving force. And here is that calculated curve. So this is the driving force. You can think about that as undercooling below the A3 temperature at which the ferrite forms. Okay? And this is the grain size that I can achieve. Now according to this, you know, I can achieve extremely fine grain sizes. So this is uh, the lower limit there is 0.01 of a micrometer. But when I take lots and lots of data from industry and I plot them on this graph, you are not doing very well. Yeah? You can see that you are stuck at about one micrometer. 
in spite of the huge amount of research that's going on, you are stuck at one micrometer grain size. Now, why, why are we stuck? Well, what happens when you go at large undercoolings is that a lot of this energy is released in the form of heat while you are processing. So the temperature rises, actually. This is a phenomenon known as recalescence. That means while the transformation happens, the temperature actually rises. Which means that you cannot achieve a large undercooling. And when we take account of recalescence, you know, the enthalpy of transformation divided by the heat capacity of your material will cause a temperature rise, and therefore you are stuck at approximately one micrometer. You could go a little bit further, but not much. Right? Uh, of course, if you reduce the thickness of your material, and you produce a very small quantity in a laboratory, then you can do it. But I'm talking about producing millions and millions of tons of steel by thermomechanical processing. We are not going to go much smaller than one micrometer in ferrite grain size. Okay? <coughs> so thermomechanical processing is likely to be limited by recalescence. So somehow, in order to produce finer grain sizes in large quantities of material, we must store the heat of transformation inside the material. Okay? And we must reduce the rate of transformation. And we must transform at a low temperature to get the very fine grain size. How do we do that? Well, given that these lectures are about bainite, bainite has to be the answer. Um, but before I go on to explain how all those parameters are met, we must introduce work hardening. Because if we don't have work hardening in the material, then we will get plastic instability and zero ductility as we go to high, high strength. Okay? This is the slide that I showed you earlier, where we basically lose ductility as we make the grain size finer. Now, the way in which bainite and martensite allow you to store energy inside the material is of course strain. You know, when bainite and martensite form, you get the shape deformation. That is a huge shape deformation. The shear strain is about 0.26. I explained to you yesterday that is much, much larger than an elastic strain, which is 10 to the minus 3. So it pushes against all the crystals surrounding it. And that is elastic strain energy which is stored inside the material. And therefore, the amount of heating that you get when phase transformation happens is smaller. Uh, work hardening capacity, very easy. We have the austenite there, which undergoes a trip effect and helps us to get uh, work hardening. Okay? So, we combine that, those two factors. Uh, we can reduce the rate of transformation by alloying and we can reduce the transformation temperature. So the question then arises, what is the lowest transformation temperature at which I can produce bainite? Okay. Is it room temperature? Is it minus 60 degrees centigrade? What is the fundamental limit to the bainite transformation temperature? And remember all the theory we did yesterday, and I showed you that straight line for the nucleation of bainite. And I showed you the physical basis for that straight line. So we should be happy to extrapolate it even if we don't have any data and use that to calculate the lowest possible transformation temperature. So this is the model that we are going to use, that the bainite forms without any diffusion, but then the carbon partitions into the austenite, and we are going to avoid this stage completely by using silicon. Okay, because we don't want cementite. Here are some calculations using all the theory that I described to you yesterday. Uh, for a hypothetical steel which has uh, three manganese, two silicon, and I'm wearing carbon along the horizontal axis. According to this, uh, I could produce bainite at room temperature. This is room temperature, 300 Kelvin. Okay. If I had uh, this sort of a carbon concentration, sorry, this carbon concentration, and the reason why I could produce bainite in this steel is because the bainite start and martensite start temperatures are both suppressed. Right? Uh, there is a possibility that the two curves will merge together. Okay, I will show you that towards the end of the lecture. But 
For this alloy, we are keeping the bainite start and martensite start temperatures separate, so I could produce bainite at room temperature or even below room temperature, in principle. What I have to show you is another graph, which gives you the kinetics of transformations. Okay? Uh, so, the next graph is the calculated time taken. And if I want to produce bainite at room temperature, it will take me about 100 years. Okay? So productivity will be very small. So I need to choose an alloy composition which allows me a minimum transformation temperature, but reasonable transformation time. And here I can form bainite in a matter of days. All right? So I'm going to make an alloy with that carbon concentration. So it has a low transformation temperature, 125 degrees centigrade to produce bainite. And remember that at that temperature, the diffusion distance of an iron atom in 10 days is 10 to the minus 17 meters. That means it's impossible for diffusion to happen. So if anybody in the audience still wants to say that bainite forms by a diffusional mechanism, you can forget it because it's impossible to get diffusion at those temperatures. So this is the carbon concentration. Uh, the silicon is there to stop cementite. We need some hardenability to prevent other transformations from happening at high temperatures. Remember that we are, want to create a strong steel, so we will suffer from impurity embrittlement. So we have to add molybdenum. And this is for just austenite grain size control. So it's a very, very simple alloy. Nothing expensive there. And the heat treatment is very simple. We austenitize and then we transform depending on the transformation temperature. The time will be determined by the transformation temperature. This is just to show you a comparison between the measured uh, rate of transformation and the calculated rate of transformation. It's, it's not terribly good agreement, but it's reasonable agreement. Okay? And this is just representing the same data in a different way, the number of days taken to form the bainite as a function of the transformation temperature. I know what you are all thinking, you know, that this is still very slow. Yeah. But wait till the end of the lecture. Uh, this is a, a very, very, very simple microstructure. It's only a mixture of austenite and bainitic ferrite. There's no martensite because the austenite has sufficient carbon concentration to remain stable at room temperature. Here is what the optical microstructure looks like. Yeah, it's a very beautiful micrograph, but nothing special there. Yeah, it looks ordinary, doesn't it? But the next micrograph that I will show you is very exciting. It's a transmission electron micrograph. But this is important because what this shows is that we've got plates of bainite which are pointing in many, many different directions. When I do transmission microscopy, I'm looking at a very, very tiny region. So it can be misleading. Yeah. So if you look at the transmission electron micrograph, look at the scale here. Okay, this is 50 nanometers. These are plates of bainite and this is retained austenite. And this is 20 nanometers. So we have produced in bulk steel a grain size which is 20 nanometers without rapid cooling, without any deformation, purely by heat treatment. Okay. This structure is finer than carbon nanotubes. The, the picture on the, at the top here is a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. Okay. So in steel, we have produced crystal sizes which are less than the size of carbon nanotube on which there are thousands of papers published. Okay. Here we have produced it inside bulk steel without any severe deformation or any rapid heat treatment because it's a slow transformation. Okay. The properties are uh, amazing. First of all, look at the hardness. The hardness is 700 vickers, right? So this is the hardest bainite ever produced and it is harder than most martensitic steels when you quench them. Okay? And remember, here we are not producing strength from carbon 
because the carbon partitions mostly into the austenite. The strength is coming from the incredibly fine size of the bainite plates. 20 nanometers, yeah? That contributes about 1600 megapascals of strength. So the strength is coming from the very fine size. The carbon is playing a role in stabilizing the austenite. Uh, so it's harder than most martensites. Uh, it's free of carbides and the strength, I will show you some stress strain curves, is in that range and we can get good toughness even though this is not a particularly clean steel. If I increase the strain rate, that means uh, in, your, in my tensile test, if I test at a very high strain rate, then the strength goes up to 10 gigapascals. So here, when you get a deviation from this straight line, this is a particular kind of experiment in which you fire projectiles. It's a Hopkinson bar test where you fire projectiles at the steel and you measure the stress strain response. And here, when you deviate from this straight line, that means you've got plasticity. So look, the strength has gone up to 10, whoops, the daisy. Strength has gone up to 10 gigapascals at high strain rates. Right? And of course, when you get to uh, this sort of region, it actually transforms into epsilon ion temporarily. Yeah? Because at very high pressures, epsilon ion is stable. I showed you that yesterday. But as soon as the pressure is relieved, it transforms back to ferrite and austenite. Okay? So that's when you get to 13 gigapascals. Now, what this indicates is one possible application of this, right? Where the slow transformation doesn't matter. And that is armor. So here is actually armor using this super bainite, uh, where they actually fire, um, you know, what, whatever they fire in the army at this stuff. And this performs extremely well. Okay, so you can see they won't tell me actually what they fire because that's a secret. And I don't want to know that. But they say it's something uh, which is a serious battlefield threat. And it stops that. Uh, now, the way that you measure the efficiency of an armor is something called the ballistic mass efficiency. That means the mass of ordinary armor to defeat uh, a threat divided by the mass of the test material to defeat the threat. So the higher the value, the better the armor is. And it takes account of density. And the normal armor, steel armor, uh, contains lots and lots of alloy carbides and its performance is about one. This is titanium. And remember that we are taking account of density here, all right? So you can't say that, oh, but I can use titanium armor because it's low density, because this ballistic mass efficiency actually takes account of density. This is alumina armor, but that can only take one shot because it's a ceramic. Yeah. And this is the super bainite, which beats everything and can take multiple shots. Right? Uh, one important thing is that we can produce the same microstructure in large sections, right? Now, we have done an experiment on 80 millimeter thickness, but our calculations say we will produce the same microstructure in 120 millimeter thickness. So you can see the hardness is uniform across that 80 millimeter section. There's one point there which I don't understand, but let's ignore that point. So here we have uh, uh, what seems to be a wonderful material, 20 nanometers thickness plates, very strong and lots of uniform ductility because we have introduced work hardening <coughs> using the austenite. Um, it uh, doesn't require any deformation or rapid cooling. And therefore, when you make a component out of it, it will not have residual stresses from quenching. Okay? So, you know, when it reaches the isothermal transformation temperature, it ha it's still austenitic. And then bainite starts to form. 
and it's very cheap. You can see that the chemical composition doesn't contain anything particular and the processing is the same as any steel because you process it in the austenitic condition. You roll it or whatever okay. and it's uniform in large sections. So we've achieved all the aims of nanostructured materials, structural nanostructured materials. Now the question is, can we make this go faster? All right? Uh, my, my own opinion is that slow is good, yeah, because you don't get any residual stresses and so on. And we are talking about strong materials here. Okay? But supposing you wanted to make it faster, then we use all the metallurgical theory that has been known for a long time. So, for example, if we refine the austenite grain size, the previous one had 100 micrometers austenite grain size, if we change it to 20 micrometers, that will increase the nucleation rate and the reaction will become faster. If we add alloying elements which increase the free energy change from austenite to ferrite, for example, aluminium or cobalt, that will accelerate transformation. So, let me just uh, show you. Uh, here are three steels. Uh, this is the original one. This is the cobalt containing cobalt and aluminium. And you can see that it's possible to accelerate transformation okay, by uh, d using alloying additions without losing properties. So again, we are maintaining the strength and properties. Okay? And this is the original microstructure. And this is the cobalt containing and cobalt and aluminium. The same properties, the same sort of elongation and toughness. Okay? So it's not a problem to accelerate the transformation and this is just to show you that the austenite is playing a role in controlling the properties by transforming during deformation. Okay, so I'll skip those slides. Now, again, uh, when I showed you the graphs uh, in the previous lecture when I discussed ductility and percolation, the data that I showed you were actually from superbainite. But we know how to make it even more ductile. This is a very simple test where the blue curve is a tensile test at room temperature. Okay? The red curve is a tensile test at 200 degrees centigrade. Okay? Now you can see that the ductility is much higher at 200 degrees centigrade. Nothing has changed in the microstructure because the microstructure itself was produced by transforming at 200. What has changed is by doing a tensile test at a higher temperature, you have increased the stability of the austenite. Therefore, the austenite decomposes more slowly during deformation than at room temperature. And you can see that the ductility becomes much, much higher. So all we have to do to improve the ductility is increase slightly the stability of the austenite. You can't improve it too much because if the austenite remains as austenite, we don't have a trip effect. Okay? So we've got to optimize the stability of the austenite. Uh, this, this is just a plot for strong steels of the fracture toughness versus the tensile strength. And he, notice the axis is starting at 20 megapascal root meters. The superbainite is in this region of strong steels. Okay? Now, I said to you that the strength of this comes from the very, very fine plate size, 20 nanometers, okay? So, 1600 megapascals of the strength comes from the very fine size. It doesn't come from carbon. So, if I temper the material, I will not lose strength until you get some sort of recrystallization. And you can see that, you know, even going up to 500 degrees centigrade for an hour, you don't actually lose the hardness. Of course, at 500 degrees centigrade, the austenite is decomposing into ferrite and cementite. So that's not good. I'm not saying that this material can be used at very high temperatures because we need the austenite there. We don't want it to decompose into cementite and ferrite. So, just to show you the tempering resistance of this steel, I've compared it against uh, secondary hardening steel in which you precipitate molybdenum carbides and so forth. Uh, but the secondary hardening steel also has a high silicon concentration here. Okay? Uh, and this is a martensitic steel also with a high silicon concentration. And you can see that the superbainite actually outperforms martensite, which is not surprising because in martensite the strength 
is coming from carbon in solution. Okay? Here we are getting strength from the very fine size of the plates. And it outperforms also the secondary hardening steel in terms of tempering resistance. And this is just to show you that you don't lose hardness until the plates of bainitic ferrite start to coarsen. So 450 degrees C, nothing really has changed. You know, the austenite, uh, austenite is still there. We have the fine plates of bainitic ferrite. And the hardness is still 670 wickers. As soon as we start to precipitate, uh, pre we have lost the austenite now. Okay? These are particles of cementite. But the hardness is still high because the particles of cementite are stopping those plates from coarsening. You have to do really severe tempering before the plates become coarser and we lose the hardness. So this is 600 degrees centigrade for 24 hours. Okay. Now there is one very odd thing about this. Uh, remember, our steel contains about one weight percent of carbon. Okay. We find that the ferrite, the bainitic ferrite, keeps 0.3 weight percent. Okay. Very, very surprising because we've held at 200 degrees centigrade for a long time and still the carbon remains inside the bainitic ferrite. Uh, even, even when you temper at high temperatures, the carbon remains inside the ferrite. Now these measurements are done using X-ray diffraction. Okay? Uh, so we have to measure the carbon concentration by converting the lattice parameter of ferrite into carbon concentration. So you could argue that there might be something wrong with that because other factors will influence the lattice parameter. So we did uh, atom probe experiments here uh, where you're looking at the carbon atoms. This is austenite and this is bainitic ferrite and confirmed exactly those results that we have about 0.3 weight percent of carbon inside the ferrite. Now the reason is that there are dislocations inside the ferrite and the carbon is actually at dislocations and when carbon goes to dislocations it prefers to be there than to precipitate as cementite. So work done long time ago by Cohen and Langford showed that the carbon would prefer to be at dislocations than to precipitate as cementite and that is confirmed by the x-ray analysis where we can, apart from looking at lattice parameter, we can also measure the non-uniform strain. The non-uniform strain comes from defects. And you can see that the amount of carbon in solution correlates strongly with the non-uniform strain. That means the defect density inside the ferrite. So the carbon is actually trapped at dislocations. And very recently, uh, a colleague of mine in Spain, Francisca Cavalero, did some more atom probe experiments where she proved that the carbon atoms are actually at dislocations inside the ferrite. Okay. Now, just to show you that with the slow transforming steel, which takes 10 days to form bainite, we have a commercial product. All right. So this is, uh, this is uh, about 6 tons of super bainite here, uh, which has been manufactured by hot rolling and this coil is made, uh, th this part over here is also super bainite. But this is uh, for a different application where fatigue is important, right? So this particular one has been produced by vacuum arc refining and vacuum in induction melting to produce uh, aircraft quality steel, okay? Uh, and uh, this is the er early stages. Okay. Uh, of course, fatigue properties are important here, and we are investigating all that, you know, whether the fatigue properties are sufficient. There's just too much work to do at the moment on this. Okay, now let me just uh, briefly talk about a project that is going on in GIFT. Uh, Hong Suk Yang is doing this work. Uh, what we would like to do is actually produce uh, super bainite with a low carbon concentration. Okay? And in other words, produced a very fine microstructure but with a lower carbon concentration. Because supposing you want to do some welding, etc., then it's useful to have a low carbon concentration. Okay? Um, now, I did some calculations some, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, where 
I thought it would be impossible to do this, right? And that, that is because we need to keep the bainite start and the martensite start temperature separate, right? And my calculations indicated that if I try to suppress the transformation temperature using nickel, then these two temperatures would come together, so beyond this point I would not be able to make bainite, right? Now it seems from Hong Suk Yang's work that it might be possible that this theory is wrong, okay? And that we might be able to make super bainite with lower carbon concentration. But it's early days yet and this is research in progress, okay? The other thing is that uh, we were able to produce uh, nanostructured perlite in this steel by transforming this uh, under a magnetic field, right? So you can see the scale of the perlite is incredibly fine and this is also extremely hard, right? So in a bulk material you can induce very, very fine perlite in the same steel. Okay, so let me finish off by again showing you this graph and I explained to you that I could produce bainite at room temperature if I had an alloy with this composition. Okay? So we made this alloy because you know in a university we do very long term research. So it will take a hundred years for this alloy to form bainite but we have made it here. Okay? So you can see this is the structure. Some of the cementite is undissolved but we've added 1.75 carbon to get 1.5 inside the austenite. Now calculations say this should transform in 100 years and we started the experiment in 2004. So we have 98 years to go and the experiment will be finished in I think 2104. Okay? Uh, this alloy you can go and observe in the Science Museum in London. Okay? And report back to me to see if the surface has changed because if bainite forms then the surface will change. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, happy for questions. <laughs>